Hi. Hi. What's your name? David Sorensen. Sorensen. Oh, there you are. Okay. Well, it's nine o'clock. Good morning. And welcome to one of the first classes that's offered by NKA for this semester. And it's a philosophy class. And my name is Gordon Wofford. And my Jean and I are facilitators for this class. And the first thing that I'd like to tell you is that we like you to sign in before every class starts. So please sign in if you haven't. I'm sure Margie had everybody sign in. And I'm here to uh, introduce your instructor for this class. His name is Lon Douglas Wofford, and he has a master or a Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy from Idaho State University, and also a bachelor bachelor's degree in English from Idaho State University. And he has lots of experience in both of these fields. And don't ask me what he's going to talk about, because I don't know. He's the one that's going to have to explain that to you. But right now, I'd like to introduce Lon. Thanks, Dan. Um, the title of the seminar is From Heraclitus to Eccles, A Brief History of Philosophy, and the subject is ontological dualism and the only, the one and only method of philosophy, which Socrates called the practice of death. So we will explain all of that as we go forward. All right, course materials are available for download or review. You can read them or, or you know, look at them online or download them so you can keep them, at uh, narrogatealliance.org. So everything is out there. The materials that are already out there would include the syllabus um, and this presentation. They'll have a PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, I haven't put anything behind a, behind a, a, a password yet, so, but I will by next week. So that would be the user ID is HOP Seminar all lowercase, and the password is NKA Fall 2012. All right, and on the on the home page, toward the bottom of the page is a contact form that you can just send me an email with if you have problems with anything, and I'll get back to you just as soon as I can. All right, so like I said, everything right now is out on the home page, so there's no passwords or anything you have to use to get into all of this stuff. And so uh, you can go out there and download the syllabus, which has all of this information, plus an, you know, uh, basically um, uh, the titles of each of the eight seminars, so you'll have an idea of where we'll be headed. Any questions? So do you need to you don't need a lot of Not right at the moment, yeah. Oh. By next week, I'll have, I'll have created the individual pages for each of the seminars, OK? So by then, you'll, you'll need to use the password and user ID in order to log in. All right, any questions? All right. Uh, the availability of materials, primary materials such as the PowerPoint presentations for the lecture, will be available on the day of the seminar. So you'll be able to go from the lecture, go right home, and download those immediately. Other materials will be available on the Wednesday following the seminar by 6 p.m. That'll give me a couple of days to get everything together and, and publish them out there. Uh, if there's more materials that I still have that I want to put out there, I'll let you know on the home page. So you can come back and check. But all the materials, we should always have all of the materials from this week's seminar available to you by Wednesday or Thursday at the latest. All right? <clears throat> now, this program and the other programs that we teach um, are the result of a fairly intensive and in, uh, integrated research synthesis project that I began 14 years ago. Um, currently, there are 30,281 research items which have been reviewed to make these programs. Uh, 13,887 books, 6,913 peer-reviewed articles, 8,869 audio files, and 612 video files. So it's a fairly comprehensive overview of the subject matter that crosses all sorts of uh, domains. Um, 
The current research bibliography includes 4,093 entries out of this 30,281. Oh. So that will be available to you. The, the bibliography will be available to you, and I'll have that out there very soon. Uh, so you'll be able to go out and take a look at, at that much of the, of the entire information. All right? Clinical research with approximately 5,000 people was also conducted in order to check and verify you know, the validity of the, of the ideas that we're trying to convey, as well as the ease with which people can learn this material. All right, questions about that? So, what can you expect to learn over the next eight weeks? First, there'll be eight 90 minute seminars. We will trace the guiding insight of philosophy, which is called ontological dualism. From its beginnings in the ancient mystery religions to all of its major elaborations to the present day. You will learn how philosophers think and, through modeling their thinking, you will learn how to think like a philosopher. Hi. Okay, so let's take a look at what we're going to learn specifically today. First, ontological dualism and practicing death from the ancient mystery religions through Aristotle. Uh, in part one, we'll talk about the ancient mystery religions. Um, they were extant probably before 6000 BCE, but that's as far back as our public records go. So we can conclusively state that they were active at least at 6000 BCE. Uh, but BCE is scholar talk for before the Common Era. There was a movement in the 1980s for all scholarly journals and all scholarly papers to switch from AD and BC to this particular format. So we have BCEs before the Common Era, which translates as BC, and uh, CE is the Common Era, which translates as AD. All right, and I, I don't really understand the reason for that. Um, it, it's exactly the same base, it just has a different uh, suffix to it. But this is what you'll see if you start to go out and research all of this. Uh, some of them will use AD and BC, but a lot of them will use the BCE and the CE. So I've just adopted that as a convention. So we'll take a look at three examples of ancient mystery religions. First, the Babylonian mysteries, then the Eleusinian mysteries, and then the Orphans. Next, we'll take a look at the basic concepts of the ancient mystery religions. And there are four that are common to all of them. First, initiation. Second, mind-matter dualism. Third, transmigration of the soul, and fourth, enlightenment through various disciplines. In part two, we'll take a look at pre-Socratic philosophy. Uh, from about 750 BCE to 469 BCE, which is when Socrates was born. We'll, talk, we'll look at four of those early philosophers. Um, Hesiod first, who was a poet rather than a philosopher, and sort of bridged the gap between the mystery religions and the pre-Socratic. Pythagoras, Heraclitus, and Parmenides. Then in part three, we'll take a look at ancient Greek philosophy, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Uh, part four, we'll take a look at ancient Eastern philosophy. We'll take a look at um, some material from the Buddha himself, and then material from a little later from Patanjali on yoga. Part five, we'll take a look at modern philosophical disciplines and how they are, uh, how we classify basically philosophy in the modern age, so that a lot of what we're talking about will make more sense. And finally, part six, we'll do um, uh, and have a class discussion on the material. I just have a question. So yes. Gonna, how long is going to take this class to do? The classes are eight. They're eight, eight and 90 minutes. Yeah, eight classes, 90 minutes each. Okay? And it's kind of a weird schedule. Uh, there are, um, in the syllabus, you'll, you'll see it up there at the very top. It, it doesn't meet every week, and there are like periods of like three weeks where, there, where we don't meet. So I'll, I'll alert you to that beforehand. Okay? All right. Any questions about the basic overview before we get into the actual? Okay, part one, the ancient mystery religions. Ontological dualism is discovered, but it's kept secret and used as a method of control. All right, our three examples of the ancient mystery religions. First, the Babylonian mysteries, um, starting around 2500 BCE. Then the Eleusinian mysteries, right around 1800 BCE to 400 BCE. 
and finally the Orphids from 600 to 300 BCE. So they sort of overlap one another, and there, there is uh, common ground among all of them. They're all being practiced by the same kinds of people. A lot of the people from Greece will, you know, travel to Babylon to be initiated and to learn about this stuff. So there's a lot of cross-cultural pollination going on here. All right? The primary tenets of all of the ancient mystery religions are that human souls are immortal and divine, that the transmigration of these immortal souls is necessary for their growth and development. Um, they all have secret initiation rites, which are necessary in order to earn the materials. And finally, they all have rigorous training programs, including somatic programs, you know, athletics, yoga, tai chi, those kinds of things. Things we do with our, with our bodies, physical things. Meditation and hypnosis. So those form the core of everything that they're doing. Hi. Well. All right. So let's take a, a closer look at the Babylonian mysteries. As I said, we have information that leads us to believe they started right around 2500 B.C. Um, all of the mystery religions um, from Babylon were based on the Mesopotamian astral theology. Uh, Mesopotamia was comprised of the four sort of kingdoms or nation states of Sumer, Assyria, Babylon, and Akkadia. So this is, all of those are, you know, right now those are the Middle Eastern countries that we know as you know, uh, Iraq, Iran, and Syria. So that's where this was all taking place, 2500 BC, right over there in Baghdad, right over there in Damascus, uh, exactly where they are now. So they've been around a long, long time. Um, mythology and theology were constructed from the observation of the motions of the celestial bodies. This is the core foundation of the astrotheological myth structure. Okay, so for example, the sun, as it travels across the sky, then is used in the myth structure to represent birth, life, death, and resurrection. Birth as it rises in the east in the morning, life as it passes through the phases of the sun, so, you know, early infancy, then, you know, middle age, then old age, and finally death as it sets in the west, and then, um, you know, 12 or so hours later, resurrection, and it starts the whole cycle over again, over and over and over again. So the sun then becomes the, the foundational structural symbol of all of the astrotheological myths. The zodiac, uh, you know, from the zodiac we get the 12 months, we get the 12 signs of the zodiac, which yield 360 day a year. And they just sort of made up the extra five days however they wanted to. Uh, the moon, you know, had 12 full cycles during that period. Uh, that leads us to the 12 apostles, the 12 tribes of Israel, and so on and so forth. So you can see that all of the all of the mythological structures that we see in the Old Testament and in these older writings is based on the astrotheological observation of what's going on in the heavens. Okay, uh, an interesting one that uh, we can still apply today is the three kings, the three kings that uh, announced the arrival of Jesus. Okay, that is really really old. It goes all the way back. Uh, even predating the Babylonian mysteries. Mm -hmm. And it refers specifically to the three stars on Orion's belt. So if you take a look at the constellation Orion, you'll see those three stars that sort of have an angle there uh, that form his belt. And there's a specific arrangement of those three stars on December 25th, on the morning of December 25th, in places that are at our latitude. We are almost, here in Pocatello, we're almost exactly at the same latitude as all of those places. Baghdad, Damascus, so on and so forth. So on the 25th of December, every year, those three stars on Orion's belt would point to the horizon where the sun was going to rise. You could trace a line right there, and at that point, that's where the sun would rise, on the 25th of December. So what we have here is the astrotheological notion that the year is ending. On the 21st to the 22nd of December, we have the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, the longest night, okay? And so that symbolized the absolute death of everything. And then for three days, from the 22nd to the 25th, there was sort of this dormant period where nothing was going on, and then on the morning of the 25th, Orion with the three kings in Orion's belt, would signify the arrival of the new sun king, the new sun god. 
and it would rise exactly where Orion's belt pointed. So that is what the three kings referred to in the myth. Uh, that was created uh, roughly around 325 uh, CE at the Council of Nicaea. All right. In fact, um, Christ's birthday was changed to December 25th by the order of Constantine, the Emperor of Rome. All right. Because prior to that, they were you know, sort of speculating on when Jesus was born. He said at the Council of uh, uh, Nicaea that it would be December 25th because that's where all the other sun gods were born. And that led back into the mystery religions and all of the astro theology. Okay? Any questions about that? I do have a question. Um, they say that Jesus was born actually like in April. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was. This was challenging just in order to give him the full honor of what happened with his birth and the, what he did for the world. Is that kind of what they... This, this, this specific change for his birthday was ordered by Constantine because Roman, Rome was pagan. And they, had, they were already celebrating oh, the Saturnalia. They were already doing all of those pagan okay. rituals. Okay. Yeah, they would, have, they would have big bonfires on the 21st to the 22nd okay. on the solstice. Okay, so he wanted, remember, to, to make Christianity at that time the state religion of Rome. Yeah. So in order to do that, in order to sort of seamlessly merge it with the existing pagan religions, which practiced the astrotheology, he, he basically told the bishops at the Council of Nicaea, we need to make some changes in your myth. Uh, Solstice is, is really related with Celtic religion, right? Uh, the Celtic, all of them, all of the astrotheological religions. So that means... Every religion from the beginning up until about 400 BCE, they're all going to be astrotheological. And of course, since we have inherited those religions, we still have astrotheological elements. Yeah? You know, I know this doesn't relate to the, well, it could, but um, we visited Tulum mm -hmm. uh, a few years back, which is on the, um, the peninsula, let's say. Mm -hmm. But down by, down by Central America. Yeah, uh -huh. But they had temples there that had like these holes in the walls that would shine sure. on a specific spot during the different solstices. Exactly. Yeah, yeah stone, so that that yeah, stone Stonehenge, um, mm -hmm. all of all of those ancient uh, megalithic structures. You're talking about Machu Picchu. Yeah. Well, no, I it's a little further south. Tulum is. Yeah, got perfect. one also that's like Machu yeah. Picchu, but it's um, so we yeah, find all of them. We have all of the other world as well. Yep, yeah. all over. Yeah, so from the very beginning, the first religion of mankind was astrotheology, and that was and that was why because that was the largest feature. Can you explain a little bit if you don't mind? I don't mm -hmm. want to take anyone out of here, of here, but but the zodiac, how that works? The what? The zodiac. Oh, the zodiac? Mm -hmm. yeah. Basically, as they were looking up at the stars, which they could see really clearly because they didn't have all the lights and the mm -hmm. fog and smog and stuff in the air. So they could look, exactly, they could look and see all of the constellations and the Milky Way, and uh, they, they needed to have means of plotting courses for their ships and their travels across land. So they were used initially as navigation. And in order to help them do that, what they started to do was to look for patterns that would make sense to them that they could then teach to other people. These became the constellations. As they began to map the constellations, they began to see that that the Earth itself traveled through 360 degrees um, throughout the course of the year. And so, so what they did was they began to demarcate various constellations that would fit in with those 30-degree cycles. Okay, 30 degrees a month, basically, is what was going on. So they looked at the stars, found patterns that were in that 30 degree for, you know, August, let's say, or September. Uh, August called it Leo, uh, September called it Virgo. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, so that's what they had up there to look at. And so that was the basis of it. It was, it was practical because it was used for navigation. It was religious because it then began to provide them additional structures for their, for their uh, theological myths creation of the gods and so forth. Okay? And so that's why everything sort of 
the, the numbers and the, the sequences that we have today, the clocks of the calendars and everything mm -hmm. derived from the things in the mm -hmm. All right? Anything else? All right. Next come the Eleusinian mysteries. Uh, from about 1800 BCE to 400 BCE, roughly. Um, their primary resurrection myth was the myth of Demeter and Persephone, which, if you recall, Demeter was the goddess of the harvest. And her daughter was named Persephone. And she decided to go down to Hades. <laughs> Out of curiosity. <laughs> Hades wanted to keep her because she was very beautiful. Demeter went to Zeus and said, Hey, Hades has stolen my daughter. <laughs> Zeus said, Well, she went of her own free will. What do you want me to do? But she basically said, Well, if you don't go help, if you don't help me go get Persephone back, I'm just gonna stop all the seasons and there will be no harvest. <laughs> so for four months, there was no harvest. So Zeus finally relented and said, fine, 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 I'll talk to Hades. He wouldn't talk to Hades. Hades said, well, I'm not going to give her up forever. I'm only going to give her up for, you know, eight months. So that was, that was how we got the seasons, according to, you know, this particular myth. Wow. Um, so that would be the exoteric meaning of the myth itself, trying to explain to the masses why there are four seasons, you know, four months of winter when Persephone is down in Hades and Demeter is, you know, basically mm -hmm. sulking, and eight months of spring and summer, when Persephone is back from Hades and Demeter is happy again. All right. However, for the mysteries themselves, for those who were initiated into the mysteries, this represented, of course, the basic pattern of practice of death. Remember, this journey to Hades is death, it's dying. You're going to Hades, you are going to the underworld, you are traveling there, you are checking out all the sites and you know, things that are there. You're talking to people and gods and demons and whatever happens to be there. You're running away from Kerberos. You're, you know, you're talking with all of these people who populate the underworld. So this represents what Socrates would later call the practice of death. Very specifically and very concretely. They were not being analogical here. They were talking specifically about a very specific practice that allowed them to travel in realms that the masses would never see. Okay? So that's what the myth was. All of them have their own myth. This happens to be the one that was created for the Eleusinian mysteries. So you have an exoteric version, the story about the seasons that they taught to the people, and then you have the esoteric version that was taught to the initiates that represented the actual practice of dying. Okay? Uh... They were, uh, the Eleusinian mysteries were divided into two basic uh, grades. You had the Lesser Mysteries and the Greater Mysteries. The Lesser Mystery rites were held once a year, and the Greater Mystery rites were held once every five years. So basically, if you were chosen, and if you, had, you, know, if you were basically an upstanding citizen from a wealthy family, you could go take the Lesser Mysteries initiations, where they would start to teach you the basic myths, and start to prepare you with some of the somatic kinds of uh, exercises. And then if you practice those faithfully for five years, and were able to demonstrate your proficiency, then they would allow you to be initiated into the greater mysteries five years later, or 10 years later, or 15 years later. But the greater mystery initiations were only held every five years. So if you didn't make it on the, you know, the, the first five year cycle, you'd have to wait five years, okay? Um, the lesser initiates were called, in Greek, the myste. This is the Greek word for it. I've included the Greek words and in the Greek language because if you're going to read any of this stuff, you're going to run into Greek. It all starts with the Greeks. So you're going to have to know what the Greek words look like. All right, so that's why I've included them in all of the documentation. Uh, this is what it would be like in Roman uh, uh, letters and then the pronunciation miste. So these were the miste, the ones who had been initiated into the, into the mysteries. Um, the greater initiates were called the epopthia, the epops. All right? And the, the, the epopthia were those miste who had mastered the art of contemplation. So that was what they learned in the lesser mysteries, the art of contemplation, the art of dying the art of philosophy. That's what it sounds like in hypothesis. 
hypothesis? Yeah. No. You, no. you know, those, yeah, two, two separate, yeah, okay. two different words. Yeah, close. Yeah, but these are the hypotheses. Okay? So this is the Eleusinian mysteries. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yeah. So is the lesson is when they are learning the art of kindness? Yes, they're, they're learning the art of, they're learning, they would be learning a kind of yoga or tai chi or other kind of physical activity. And we'll look at that more specifically when we get to the Eastern religions, uh, the Eastern philosophies, when we look at, at um, uh, 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 the yoga sutras of Patanjali. He will tell us exactly what they were doing. Okay, so we'll take a look at that. So that's one of the things they were doing. They were also learning meditation, and they were also learning hypnosis. Those are the three primary tools that they were using. And so they, they would have learned that, as well as the, the myths, as well as the stories, the teaching fables and things like that, they would have learned that to become a mystic. Yeah, then they had to master that. Uh, specifically, what they would have to do was they would have to they would have to be able to successfully pass by surviving the baptism ritual. Okay. Now, what we think of as baptism today, in the exoteric version of it, is fairly simple. You know, some kind of water, some kind of incantation, some prayer, like that. For them, it was a real test of endurance. They would be held under the water for three minutes. Okay, so they would, one of two things would happen. They would either survive because they had mastered the lesser mystery. Exactly, or they would die. So they would drown. Oh, yeah. really yes. Well, it's not necessarily hard to do, but they had to practice it. Right. So if you were not perfectly confident that you were going to be able to pass that test, you would wait another five years. Mm. Okay? This was not a test you could afford to fail. Yeah, they were serious about it. Only those people who succeeded were allowed to go on and learn the greater mysteries. Alright? If you did not, if you had not practiced, you would die, or you would not, not come in. Okay? So they were very serious about this. Okay. Uh, Finally, we'll take a look at the Orphics. Uh, right around 600 BCE and following, we're not, it, it's, you know, it was there even in uh, Aristotle's time, even later, when the Neoplatonists were still there. The Orphics were still around. So were the Eleusinians. They had just sort of changed their name. They became the Gnostics. Um, the pri their primary myth was based on the mystical poet Orpheus. So there's the Greek word over there, uh, pronounced Orpheus. And Orpheus descended into Hades in order to learn the sacred knowledge of the gods, and then returned to teach this knowledge to his chosen disciples through the process of initiation and asceticism. So here again we find initiation and discipline. And we'll take a closer look at asceticism in just a minute to define exactly what it means. Okay, once again we have the descent into Hades, the practice of death, to gain the knowledge that one can gain from that, and then the return, so that you can pass that knowledge on through the practice of initiation and, and uh, self-discipline. So, just to review the common tenets of all of the uh, ancient mystery religion, human souls are immortal, and they're divine. All right, But they are required to undergo successive incarnations in this grievous circle of life in order to test and to train their souls to leave the grievous circle in order to live with the gods. This is the purpose, this is the function of life in general, according to all of the ancient mystery religions. All right, basic training was the secret initiation rites and asceticism. The initiation rites were narrative and dramatic psychodramas. We'll take a look at some of them a little later on in the course. We'll take a look at some of the modern ones that have survived from that time. We'll take a look at specifically some that come from the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. So we can see what they look like. We'll be able to see the actual structure of these things. What is that? The what is what? The, of the, Golden Dawn. the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn? Yeah, I don't know what that it is. It was a capitalistic society formed in the early 1800s. Uh -huh. Okay? okay. Oh, I'm sorry, late 1800s, 1880. Oh, okay. All right, well, like I said, we'll get to that. Okay. But that, what we will look at then, is a modern version of these narrative and dramatic psychodramas that these guys perfected 6,000, 8,000, 10,000, 15,000 years ago. Okay? The ancient stuff didn't go away. 
it is still there still alive, still being practiced to this very day by those who have been initiated. Okay? It is still alive. All of it, from the beginning till now, in exactly the same form. It didn't go away. It's not just some silly myth that we've surpassed. It is still alive and active. That is one thing that I want to stress. This ancient knowledge is still alive and active today. Okay? Next was asceticism. In Greek, it's asthesis. And it means exercises. Okay? We'll take a look at the formal structure of the exercises, the asthesis, the asceticism, a little later, like I said, when we look at the tangible. And finally, contemplation equals meditation. So these are the skills. Hypnosis, meditation, physical exercise. Specific kinds of physical exercise. Ascetic exercise. Okay, we'll take a look at that. <clears throat> Questions? Well, the initiation, before you could learn the, the meditation and the hypnosis, you would have to go through the initiation process. In other words, you'd have to be tested and prepared through this cycle drama. All right? And so that... Like I said, we'll take a look at the psychodramas in detail a little later on in the course, when they will make a little more sense. So that was like a foundation. It was the foundational thing. You had to go through that first. You would know nothing. When you, when you entered the lesser mysteries, you would have, you know, just basically what you'd heard on the street or what you'd learned from, from other people. But since it's secret, okay, and since they enforced their secrecy by execution, it was, it was secret. Nobody really knew this stuff. Only the initiates knew it, for real. Okay? So, you would know nothing for real when you, when you entered the first initiation rites in the Lesser Mysteries. And so it would prepare you. It's a psychodrama. It's actually going to, you know, it's, it's going to... Different impacts. What's that? Different impacts in your... Yeah, life. absolutely. It is going to be definitely very emotional. It's going to, you know, it's going to have a psychological, uh, psychodynamic impact okay. on you. To prepare you for learning the mysteries later on. Anything else? Were they able to get out? To get out of of okay. the society? Well, the initiation, yes. Were no. they able to get out? They no. Out. Yeah. Again, this was like I said. They were very, uh, uh, shall we say, um, um, serious <laughs> about enforcing the secrecy of this. Yeah. You know, I think this is fascinating because it has. It has a, a science in it. Oh, yes. Uh, but yeah. it is also, it had made to the people, since it was a, such a secret, it made you mm -hmm. kind of believe why it's such a secret, you know? So it's because it was used, because this was taught to the people who were, who were in power, mm -hmm. the ruling elite. So they were they just learned looking this. for power. Exactly. They were the ones who learned this. And so part of what they learned was that the science of, you know, leadership, of, mm -hmm. of rulership. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the most single studied element in our lives is not nuclear physics or biochemistry or, you know, travel to the other planets. It is human beings. Mm -hmm. Human beings are the most studied yeah. element of this planet. And they have been studying us. It. Yeah, they have been studying us for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. The information we have now has been validated by, you know, scientific methods and scientific research, but it started, mm -hmm. you know, three million years, who knows? Mm -hmm. We don't know how far back it started, but we are the most studied thing on this planet. And the ones who run this place know this stuff because they're initiated into it and they're given the secret knowledge, even now. Yeah. Okay? So, yeah, nothing, nothing has changed since the ancient times. Nothing has changed. I think in behavior, because environmental, you can kind of be a little more assertive, which they did in their time too. Well, they they could if they were. Yeah, uh, it was impo it was very difficult if you were a Greek, well, if you were an Egyptian slave, it would be very difficult to be assertive because over three thousand years of slaveholding, the mm. Egyptian slave masters learned that if they fed you eight hundred calories of bread and water. You'd have just enough energy to go out and move some rocks around, 
and then go and sleep for the rest of the night. You wouldn't have enough energy to think, you wouldn't have enough energy to talk, you wouldn't have enough energy to be a troublemaker, and you would not have enough energy to escape. So, no, only the people who, who were in charge even had a chance of access to this kind of information. Everybody else was completely ignorant, didn't know how to read and write, had no knowledge, mm -hmm. except what was provided to them by the leadership. Mm -hmm. That's why there's radiation also, there were so many books fighting. Yes, all of that. Anything else before, before we continue? Okay, uh, part two is pre-Socratic philosophy. The pre-Socratics begin the systematic elaboration of the process of enlightenment. Because that's what the ancients called this. This is the process of becoming an enlightened person. All right, so first, Hesiod. Uh, the dates are kind of, we don't know, <laughs> uh, roughly 750 BCE to 650 BCE. He probably wasn't 100 years old when he died, but somewhere in that time frame he was writing. Uh, there's the Greek, okay, Hesiodas, pronounced Shiodas. The D, the delta, is, is a, a, a hard the sound, so it's Shiodas because the H is silent. And uh, the, the name, Shiodas, means he who emits the voice. So it was a, a title. It was a title that he selected for himself. Um, Hesiod and Homer were the primary poets of the Ionian period in Greek history, 750 to 650. His play, Theogony, detailed the origins of the universe and of the gods. That is the, that is the one, one, there are only two of his that are, uh, survive, and that's one. Uh, Greek, there is Theodonia, okay? Theodonia, the birth of the gods. So that's what he's talking about. This is a myth structure. This is a myth. This is a fable about the beginning of the universe and the birth of the gods. All right? And in it, you will find all of those myths from the ancient mystery religion, because he would have been an initiate in the Eleusinian mysteries. And he would have taken that information and used it in order to create the exoteric myths that he then wrote about and presented to the public at large. All right. It also provides the mysteries that link the older mystery religions with the Orphics, the Pythagoreans, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. So he's sort of the link between the ancient mystery religions and the ancient Greek philosophers. All right. Pythagoras lived 570 BCE to 495 BCE. That's the Greek word for it there, Pythagoras, Pythagoras. Okay, that was a pretty easy one. That's a simple one. He was the first of the major pre-Socratic philosophers. He is actually the one who created the terms philosopher and philosophy. Uh, Greek, philosophia, lover of wisdom. Someone who contemplates the world around him. He talked about other people who were good artisans, people who were good craftsmen, people who were good goldsmiths. There were also people who were good at contemplation, contemplating the world around them, meditating on the world around them, and he called those philosophers. Lovers of wisdom. All right. He incorporated the initiation rites and the ascetic exercises of the mystery religion into his own philosophical system. And it is this philosophical system, combined with the Eleusinian mysteries, that will be taught to Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle later on, and then comes through them to us, through Western philosophy. He discovered the contemplation, the act of contemplation, the art of contemplation, meditation and asceticism allowed the philosopher to experience directly the formal structures of physical objects in the material world. This formal structure he called the essence of the object, and he suggested that the essence can be represented numerically, that every object had a numerical essence. Okay, and the mathematics is the science of essences. All right, and of course he's most famous for the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides. Now that had been a, an unproven theorem about <coughs> five or six hundred years up to that point, but Pythagoras actually discovered a proof. And so he was able to show, uh, using this proof, that mathematics was not only practical, but also mystical. <laughs> okay? Heraclitus. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, he lived from 535 BCE to 475 BCE. In Greek, it's um, uh, Heraklitos, so it's Heraklitos. Um, I just, you know, uh, Americanized it's Heraclitus. 
um, he was called the obscure, Heraclitus the obscure, because his writing, of which only fragments remain, is difficult to comprehend. Even if it weren't fragmented, it would be difficult, because he specifically wrote so it would be difficult to comprehend. Okay? He made three primary contributions. He talked about two different realms of being, the one, okay, and the many, all right? And it's just this fragment where he talks about the one and the many. Um, we will later on, when we look at Plato, we'll see that the one refers to the world of being, the world that the philosopher contemplates. It is unified. Okay? It's the world of essences that Pythagoras was talking about. All right? It's, it's unmovable. It is, you know, constant and all those other things. But many refer to the world of becoming, all of this. Okay? So we have the world of becoming out there, the many, and then we have the one. Uh, and then he talked about flux, the world of becoming in constant motion. But the world of being is stable, unchanging, and unmoving. So the one is the world of the soul, and the many is the material one. What amazes me is his family was totally killed. Yes. And he went and joined the guy that killed his family. Mm -hmm. That is what, why I'm here, because I wanted to learn more about how based on what he did that, how he was able to overcome and be so such a, you know, because he, he began to be big. Yeah, Pythagoras, he's, he's actually the beginning point, uh, because, I mean, Heraclitus, sorry, he's, he's mm -hmm. the beginning point of, of the, of the uh, transition from the ancient myth structures that were sort of ruling everything up to that point to the age of reason, mm -hmm. which is where we'll get to when we start talking about Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. They want to take it away from the myth makers. Okay? Uh, finally, uh, Parmenides, 515 to 450 BCE, it's pronounced Parmenides, and that was at the delta of the Vesa. Only one word survives in fragmentary form, it's called on nature. It had three parts to it. There was a prologue or proem where he just sort of introduces it. Then a section entitled The Way of Appearance, or The Way of Opinion, depending on how you want to translate it. Doxa, the Greek word is doxa, doxa, doxa is how, how they would pronounce it. Doxa, okay, orthodox, orthodoxy. Doxa, opinion. The world of becoming and sense perception is where you get opinions from. You can only have opinions about the material world because it's constantly in flux, as Heraclitus mentioned. Nothing you say about the material world is true in any given sense because by the time you utter the sentence, by the time you utter the opinion, the world has changed. Okay? But at the top, I believe the way of hearing is opinion it also is projection. No. Remember, we're talking about the difference between truth and opinion. Truth oh, and yeah. opinion here. So, uh, the way of truth, Aletheia, and we'll see this a lot, that talks about the world of being, where the soul and reason, um, you know, the world of the one, which is stable, unchanging, constant, where you can actually utter the truth. Talk about essences and things like that. And not get caught up in the world of opinion. So we're building. We're building now towards the world of rational reason. Questions? No? Okay. Finally, the ancient Greek philosophy here, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle systematized the methods and doctrines of philosophy. All right. Socrates um, lived from 469 BCE to 399 BCE when, of course, he was executed by the democratic leadership of Athens for basically they didn't they decided just that they didn't like him around anymore. Okay? Um, he is the founder of Western European thought. Socrates is the beginning of what we would consider to be modern European thought. Um, he was an epoch of the Eleusinian mysteries. So that means he was, you know, he had gone through the greater initiation of the mysteries. He was also an epoch of the Pythagorean mysteries. Okay? He wrote nothing down. Not a single word, not a fragment, nothing. He never wrote anything down. 
he is only known through the writings of others, mostly through Plato's dialogues. Plato was a student, and so we have the Socratic dialogues where the Socrates that Plato knew is presented in dramatic form. Aristophanes' play The Clouds, which was written about Socrates' trial and execution. It's a comedy. Uh, and finally, Xenophon's dialogues, which are sort of similar to Plato's dialogues, but not quite as um, philosophically astute. But we do get glimpses of, of Socrates' personality in Xenophon. Okay? In Plato's Phaedo, for example, Socrates defines a philosopher as someone who practices death. So once again, we come back to this idea that the ancient mystery religions encapsulated in their myth of traveling to Hades and returning. That's how they represented this concept, this process of practicing death. And he specifically says that. In Greek, it's an elite fantasy. Okay? To study or practice death. In the Phaedo and elsewhere, this phrase is always linked with asthesis, the initiates exercises of contemplation. So they're specifically talking about a, a very concrete method of uh, practice in order to practice death, in order to separate soul from the body and travel in these realms of being and discover the essences of things and get away from opinion and get towards truth. Okay? There's a word for it that when the, the person actually dies, uh -huh. what is the word called? The person that actually dies and then comes back. There are, currently there are studies, uh, right now there are studies, several studies, uh, that have collated uh, anecdotal information. Catatonic is what it's about. Well, a catatonic? Mm -hmm. Well, a, a person who's catatonic is still living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're just immobile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there are, you like, rain, 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 well, yeah, not, not today. Not, not medical now, yeah, yeah, but yeah, they were, yeah. before they were even buried. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. In fact, Edgar Allan Poe wrote mm -hmm. several stories about people being buried. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you were to go back to some of the burial grounds from the early 1800s, you'll see these chimneys with bells mm -hmm. that are still there. So that in case you were buried and you woke up, you could ring the bell and yeah. someone would come and dig you up. Uh, so yeah, there, there was definitely that. Uh, however, this is a specific practice. Okay. Okay, so this is this is a specific technique which we will discover. Okay, Plato uh, lived from 424 BCE to 348 BCE. Uh, in Greek, it's Platon, and it means broad. Okay, and it's the origin of our word plate, you know, broad. Why? His real name was uh, Aristocles, son of Aristotle. Okay, but he never, I mean, he never went by that. It was always Plato. You're called Plato. Mm -hmm. Plato is a vicious open. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, he was Socrates' principal student, um, and uh, later on, Alfred North Whitehead would say the safest general characteristic characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. Okay, and that was in. Oh, where is that? Yeah, this one right here, process, process and reality. Okay, this was written in 1907. So what he is basically saying is that everything since Plato is simply a footnote to Plato. Plato mapped out the whole idea. Everything is there. Everything is already in Plato in some form or another. And uh, subsequent philosophers have simply gone back and tried to explicate a little bit more about what Plato was trying to say. <clears throat> um, for this seminar, for the first seminar, we'll take a look at five ontological and epistemological elements. In seminar eight, we'll take a look at some of the political elements from Plato. Okay? But right now, we're just going to take a look at ontology and epistemology, which are the theory of being and the theory of knowledge. Okay? What is real and how do we know things? Um, a philosopher practices death in the Phaedo, and here's the, if you wanted to read this section, it starts at 67E. Paragraph 67e. Um, anamnesis, which is the opposite of amnesia. Mm -hmm. Anamnesis is remembering. Okay, the theory of the forms, which is uh, was in the Theaetetus. The allegory of the cave and the myth of, of air. 
What did he mean the allegory of the cave? The allegory of the cave is a famous uh, story about the process of enlightenment okay. in the Republic. Okay? So, in the Phaedo, basically, this, this is taking place like two hours before Socrates is going to be executed. He's got a bunch of people there, including Plato and some other, and some young kids, some young students of Socrates. And the kids are asking him questions about death, because they're curious about it. And one of the questions they asked him, of course, is, are you afraid to die? And he said, no, I'm not afraid to die. They said, well, why not? They said, well, because there's you know, two possibilities. <clears throat> Either it all ends, in which case that's fine, because I won't be in pain. They won't have to worry about anything anymore. OK, or you know, consciousness continues, and I'll just move on. And they said, oh, well, that's you know, a facile kind of an answer. That's the kind of an answer my mother would give me. I, I want something a little more deep. And this is where he says, OK, I will tell you. You'll learn about this a little later if you, you know, go through the initiation process. Philosophers practice death. He said, from the moment of my initiation, I've been practicing death. I do it every day. I do it all the time. I'm always here, and I'm always there. He said, I know it like the back of my hand. I know it like the streets of Athens. I know the other side like the streets of Athens. So of course I'm not afraid, because I've been there. I know exactly what it's, what it's about. I've been there every day of my life since I was a young man. So he said, that's what you'll learn how to do. So of course I don't fear death. In fact, I'm looking forward to it. I'm 70 years old. You know, I have, I'm starting to get you know, ill. Um, and I, it's time to leave. And he said, I, I, I'm forbidden because of you know, the, my oath. I'm forbidden to commit suicide. So this. You know, the government of Athens has kindly allowed me to <laughs> escape without violating my oath. So he said, I'm ready for the hemlock at any time. Okay, so this is where he talks about, in the Phaedo, this is where he talks about uh, philosopher practicing death. And it's a, it's a fairly long um, dialogue, which has a lot of other things in it, too, including the concept of anamnesis. This is, this is one of Plato's arguments and proofs of the existence of an immortal soul that keeps coming back again and again. He said, how do we know anything? Because we're remembering it from a previous lifetime. We're remembering it. We don't learn anything new. We're just remembering what we learned last time. And so he talks about that in the Phaedo as well. And if that's true, and, and uh, in the Theotetus, he also gives a pretty good uh, demonstration of anamnesis. He's saying it's the remembering that is key. Everything that we do in order to teach someone something is just getting them to remember what they already know. And um, so basically he says, I can teach someone who knows nothing about geometry all of Euclid's principles, all of his theories, without, without ever referring to Euclid or without ever referring to geometry in itself. And then he proceeds to demonstrate that. Okay? Um, in the Meno, he uses a, 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 a student named Meno in order to, to do that. Okay? And the, the theory of forms um, is the description that Plato gives us about the world of being the world of the one, the world that the philosopher practices when he practices death to go and contemplate the essence of the world. And he talks about the theory of the forms. Um, and he says, there you'll discover all of the essential forms that these are representatives of. Chairs, tables, people, cameras, walls, whatever. There you will find the perfect wall. There you will find the perfect chair. There you will find the essence of the perfect government. Okay, And then you'll come back here, take a look at the world of becoming, the world of the many, and you'll see that these are all imperfect copies of that perfect form. And that's one of the ways that we learn things. That's one of the ways that we know things. Because how would I recognize that as a chair unless I had some access at some time to the actual form of a chair? Because not all chairs look the same. Not all desks look the same. Not all people look the same. So the only way I can discriminate among the particulars is because I've already had access to the universal form. Another proof that the soul is transmitting. Okay? In the allegory of the cave, he talks about the normal person, the person who hasn't been through the mysteries. And they're like people who are chained in a deep, dark cave facing the wall facing the back wall of the cave. They're chained there. They can't move. They can't get up and walk around, and they can't move their heads. And what they see projected on the front wall in front of them, on the back wall in front of them, are shadows, you know, shadow forms that are created by people behind them in the firework. And they think that's reality. 
They think that the shadow play on the back wall is what's real. Okay? But one of the people manages to break free. And he turns around and he looks, and at the far distance he can see this little pinpoint of light, which is the entrance to the cave. He says, oh, what, well, I wonder what that is. So he travels back there to the entrance to the cave, and he steps out into the real world. You know, sunlight, birds, trees, everything else like that. He says, wow, this is amazing. You know, I've been living my whole life in this cave thinking that that was real. When, look at this. This place is amazing. So he goes back down in the cave, and he tries to get the people there to believe him, to break their chains and follow him out of the cave. But most of them are saying, leave me alone. I'm too busy watching this, you know, what's going on in the real world here. Leave me alone. Don't bother me. Go away. So finally, you know, the, the philosopher who has now made this trip to the real world, the world of the forms, and has seen the glory of the formal world, of the one, of the essences, by practicing death, okay, has to make a choice between staying in that world or coming back and trying to convince the rest of the people that the cave shadows that they're seeing are not the real world, that they need to actually practice this stuff go to the real world and figure out what's going on for real. So that's the allegory of the cave. And also, the cave can have a delirious mind, huh? Yes, except it also applies to, you know, it also applies, Plato, he also applies it to propaganda. Okay? If, you, if the only thing you have available to you is propaganda from a, you know, from a governmental or religious source, Okay, that is based solely on opinions about the ever-changing world of becoming, then there's no way you can ever hold fast to a reality. And you'll be just whipsawed back and forth. But I think we can focus on a lot of spirituality there, too, because the only, how are you able to foresee all these things in order to process in your mind and separate things and put them together in the same context? The only way you can do that is by practicing the aspects. If you don't practice the ascesis, you never will be able to attain to the forms. Okay? It has to be done through the ascesis itself. It has to be done through the discipline. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Okay? And that's the only way to do it. Anything other than that is more doxa, more doxa, more opinion. Okay? And finally, the myth of the air. In the Republic, towards the end of the Republic, this is almost the last of the, of the Republic, he talks about being out on the battlefield. Huge battle. At the end of the battle, at the end of the day, they go out and collect their dead. One of them is a friend of his uh, from Peloponnesia. And uh, this person is made a care, and he appears to be dead. So they, you know, for three days, they get everything ready for the funeral pyre and everything else. And on the third day, third day, three stars. Okay, so this is a myth structure that Plato is deliberately constructing. Uh, on the third day, now remember, this is 400 years before the myth of Christ because he's got access to all of these other astrotheological myths to base his myth on. Three days after three days, just before they light the fire to, to cremate Air's body, he wakes up. He says, you know, hi, don't burn me, you know, don't, don't light that fire. And they say, wow, where have you been for three days? And he begins to tell them where he's been. He's been on the other side. He's been to the world of the forms, and he's seen everything that's over there. But it wasn't his time to die, so he was sent back. It wasn't his time to stay over there, so he was sent back, basically with the story, so that he could describe what it was like on the other side. So this is the myth of air, which tells about uh, a near-death experience, basically. I do have to maybe make a comment. In Latin America and some parts of Europe, with the exception, like, uh, I, I don't know, I know for sure it's like in Afghanistan, uh, they, they bury the dead immediately there. Mm -hmm within 24 hours, mm -hmm. yeah. but in the rest of the world, uh, not, I'm not including the United States now, like in Latin America, most of them, they have European, you know, ancestors or mm -hmm. whatever is there. They have to bury, I mean, they have to uh, have the body in the house for three days mm -hmm. with curtains and everything, but they cannot, and the body is not prepared. Right, it, yes. You just, know, who knows what, I don't even know because over here you take the body and of course the body starts looking through it everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there I don't know why, how they do it because there is not a process they do it. But they keep it three days before they can be there. So it right. comes from this? Yeah, it comes from this. Mm -hmm. It comes from the astrotheological. Yeah, it comes from all of these really things. 
Yeah, very ancient practices, mm -hmm. late ancient practices. Yes. Yes. Okay, next we have Aristotle, um, 384 BC, even 322 BC. Aristoteles, it's his Greek name, he was Plato's primary student, and he was also the principal tutor to Alexander the Great. Okay, founded his own school called the Lyceum in 335. Um, uh, in, in Greek, the Lyceum was or the Lucio. Lucio. Okay. Now, he, three ideas that will carry forward in, in our discussions here. One is the idea of substance, uh, the Greek word osita. All right. Substance means essence. Same thing that Pythagoras was talking about with the essence of things being numerically represented. Um, that is a subject or an object that exists in itself and not in another subject or object. Okay? and cannot be attributed to another subject or another object, a being by itself. So something that is a substance is its own being. Uh, next is the bios theoreticos. Um, uh, bios, because the B is pronounced with a B sound, the ba, uh, bios theoreticos. This is Aristotle's term for the life of perfect contemplation, which the philosopher seeks and which is the highest good for mankind. If we had more people practicing philosophy, practicing death, hanging out in the, you know, in the world of the one, then that would, that would translate into greater good for the people, according to Aristotle and according to Plato. And most importantly, first philosophy. Philosophia prose. First philosophy. Okay? Aristotle's term for what later was called metaphysics. And we'll talk about that in just a second. He defined it as the definite science which inquires into beings as being. Okay? and into that which belongs to it as such. So first philosophy is the study of being, beings as being. Being, the one, the world of the forms. That's first philosophy. That's what philosophy is, and that is the, everything follows from that. So the question is, what is metaphysics? Everybody's heard of that. It's a big, new thing, old, new age term. Okay, and it refers to those things which are unseen, the worlds of the soul, you know, the worlds of the divine, the worlds of the gods, the worlds of whatever, you know. Okay, however, that's not what it originally meant. Uh, Aristotle's first editor, Andronicus of Rhodes, uh, arranged all of Aristotle's works in this big row. Just, you know, because they were all handwritten, remember, so he just put them all in a big row uh, before he made copies of 